You know what's so cool about photography? You can turn something like this and wave your phone around like this. And then it becomes something like this. Welcome to Low Life Photography. Hi, welcome back to the channel. I feel like it's been a while since we've done one of these, one of these photography tutorials, but thank you to those on Patreon that gave me this amazing idea for some low light photography. This is absolutely one of my most favorite techniques of all time. Today, we're gonna talk about what low light photography is. We're gonna talk about why it is arguably one of the most difficult aspects of photography. And thirdly, I'm gonna hit you with some tips back to back to back on how you can improve your own low light photography. So let's talk about what it is exactly. Low light photography, means you are either indoors or you are away from sources of light. It's dark. Either you are in a cave, a forest, or just in an area where light is very limited. Now, low light photography turns out to be very difficult because your pictures turn out to be very shaky. And that's because your shutter speed is on a very low setting. So your camera is unable to process the image as fast as it normally would with a ton of light. If you're unsure about camera settings, here's a video explaining all of that. So with a low shutter speed, your camera is going to have a very hard time compensating for all that fast movement. And then therefore, when you're holding the camera, you're gonna get all that hand shakiness in your photo. Now in turn, if you want to increase your artificial source of light, your camera's sensitivity to light by increasing the ISO, the problem with that is that you can only go to a certain amount of, a certain range before it starts introducing a lot of grain, a lot of noise into your photo, and that's a problem. So here are five things that you can do in order to work around or improve that situation. Number one, my absolutely favorite, most favorite technique of all time, and that is long exposure photography. I have used this technique across a ton of my photos from the beginning till now, and it is absolutely amazing. So for this, you're gonna need a tripod. Now this one is a $35 one that I use. It is linked down below. Or you can also put your camera on a stack of books on anything that you could just lean against so it's nice and stable. And then you're gonna move your shutter speed to the left and decrease it so it's around five seconds, meaning your shutter is going to remain open for that long and then take in as much light as possible. You'll also want to eliminate as many light sources as possible and in turn, grab any kind of light source you want. And of course, don't forget your subject for today. We're also going to use board games as per usual for the main subject of interest. The applications of this, eh, it's not much. You can just take photos like this and like this and like this. When I first found this out, it blew my freaking mind. So how are you not freaking out right now? There are so many applications of this. So for example, on my Instagram, I posted a IG reel on how I used fairy lights to do the same technique here with long exposure photography. Right, so it's pretty cool. All you're doing here is setting your camera to have a low shutter speed. And then you can just play around with any kind of light source. And then that light is just going to be kind of just waving in with a lot of motion throughout. So instead of just having one little light bulb, you have all these streaks of light instead in your photo. It's very cool. Here's a pro tip. What you saw me do in the beginning was that uh, with my phone, all you have to do is Google iPhone gradient wallpaper and then just choose any color you want. So you can put blue iPhone gradient wallpaper. And then you're going to pinch to zoom in on your phone to make sure it takes up the entire screen lock your phone, and in turn, that becomes a very cool gradient for you to use in order for you to get that very nice gradient 3D depth effect. One of my favorite pictures of all time was one I took of Lords of Hellas, and for that one, I used steel wool, but I also posted some behind the scenes right here. Right, so that one is one I used for a recent shoot that I did on Tapestry. Number two, let's say you need to hold your camera. Let's say you're in a setting where you don't have the feasibility to use a tripod or to hold it up or prop it up against anything else, your, it being your camera. Let's say you have no way to prop up your camera at all. What you can do instead is to start introducing your own source of light. So in this case, the first one I think of is using an external flash. One of the most common mistakes I see with people using an external flash is that they'll take it and point it straight at their subject. A lot of the times that's going to look really, really bad. Here's an example. So if you were to point your flash directly at your subject, you're going to get a ton of harsh lighting. And on top of that, you're going to lose a ton of detail. It just looks very, very bad. It creates very, very harsh shadows on top of having very harsh, bright lit lighting on your subject, which is usually 
Not a good thing. This one is easy fix. All you have to do is take your external flash, point it straight up, and that's called bounce lighting. So the light is going to bounce across the ceiling and across the walls, and then it's going to come back down onto your subject. Think of it as like a rain of light. So see here how it has a very nice diffused, even lighting across the pyramid. That's the effect you want over the first one, which was way too harsh. Same idea if you are photographing human subjects. A lot of the times it's not very flattering to just point the light directly at them. On top of that, they're going to be very annoyed very, very quickly if you just point flash directly in their face. Of course, there are always exceptions to this. Sometimes the only choice you have is to point your flash directly at your subject. In that case, you still want to diffuse the light as much as possible so it kind of spreads out evenly. And one thing you can do is either put a piece of paper in front of your flash or use some kind of diffuser that attaches right onto your flash directly. Tip number three, shoot in RAW. If you aren't already shooting in RAW now, it is 2020, we need to be shooting in RAW. Our phones now, actually as of the iPhone 12, if you have an iPhone, if you have another type of phone, I'm pretty sure you had RAW ages ago. Either way, um, our phones now can shoot in their own forms of RAW. So with a DSLR, you should definitely be shooting in RAW if you aren't already. The only reason you wanna shoot in JPEG is if you wanna save space, but there is a massive world of a difference if you're shooting in RAW versus if you're shooting in JPEG. Especially for low light photography, you really wanna shoot in RAW because you can bring back a photo to life, literally, by shooting in RAW. And that's because you are going to lose a ton of information if you're shooting it in JPEG. Check out this photo and see how fast it gets grainy and really nasty and disgusting when you are shooting in JPEG versus here's a photo that I took in RAW. So automatically you're thinking, oh wait, it's super dark. You can't really salvage that. It looks really bad. A lot of times actually when a lot of my family and friends and just people looking over your shoulder as you're taking photos, they see your photos in a 10 inch LCD screen and it looks pretty bad or actually it looks very dark and you can barely see what's going on. But that is the magic of RAW because once they see the edited version, they're like, what the hell? Like, where did that come from? It just, it was pitch black. How did you even bring that back? And that is because you're shooting in RAW. Moving on to tip number four, and that is if you have minimal sources of light, if you have little to no light at all, guess what? That means you have an empty blank canvas, my friend. Blank canvas. That means you have more control over the light that you are introducing into that entire setting. For example, in this photo that I'm about to show you, I use this light stick and put it right behind my minis. And then I took another form of this exact same light stick, which is currently lighting up this side of the frame over here. Took that one and made it vertically just like this so you can light up the subject or the minis themselves. Because I turned off all my backyard lights and it was uh, nighttime, you get to see a very nice punchy look to the overall photo. If I were to do the exact same setup in the day, it would look nothing like that. The sunlight is way harsher than the light sticks themselves, so you would lose all of that punchiness. The sun's gonna project a different type of color that's gonna go onto the rain droplets that you see there instead of all those teal and white lights that kind of reflect against each other in the raindrops. On top of that, you're going to get a lot of bleed through from other sources of light if you don't have an empty blank canvas like you do at night. Like if you're shooting the day, you have light bleeding through the blinds, you have light coming underneath the door, who knows where light's coming from. So overall, shooting in a no light source area and environment, it gives you more focused, more isolation of your subject. And that leads me directly to tip number five, which is a combo tip actually, and it deals directly with camera settings. So you wanna make sure that your aperture is set to the lowest setting possible, which means you are letting in as much light as possible to your camera. And you also want to understand your camera's range for ISO. For example, an entry level camera, the Canon 80D, which is my backup camera, that camera can go up to 800 ISO before it starts introducing a ton of grain. Anything above 800 ISO from what I've found over the many years that I've taken photos with it, it introduces a ton of grain and you can barely use any kind of photos that are pushed beyond 800 ISO. In contrast, the camera that's filming me right now, which is the Canon 1DX, that one can be pushed all the way to 3200 ISO arguably even 5,000 ISO before you start seeing little bits of grain. 800 ISO versus 3,200 ISO, that is a massive difference. But it's important because if you know your camera's range and what it can be pushed to, then that's going to affect you know where you're gonna go for your location, what sources of light that you need to bring, and your overall plan for how you're going to stage your entire photo. So those are five tips that I have for you for low light photography. I hope you found all that helpful. And with that, I'll see you all in the next video.